Welcome back. We are in Senior English A, and we are now ready to talk about the wife of Bath's tale. Let's cover a little bit of ground as you got your annotations ready to go. And you have your book open to page 138, 139, okay? Two things. One, when we read the story of the wife of Bath, we want to see some relationship <laughs> between her prologue and the story. Now let's get it out of the way. What was the major thing she said in the prologue? I realize you didn't read it, you just listened. But what was the major thing she said about relationships between men and women? That what? She says what should be the relationship between a guy and a girl? Let me ask it this way. How does she say a guy can get a girl to love her? Trust. Keep going. Let her have freedom. That's key. You want to write it down. She says, if a guy really wants a girl to love her, the key is you better let her have freedom. Do what she wants. Okay? Now, when we look at the wife's tale, we're going to pay close attention to that relationship. Number two. I said that Chaucer is a great iconoclast. That means he goes after sacred views and he kind of bashes on them. One of the things that the Wife of Bath's Tale will do is it will challenge views of class hierarchy. Class hierarchy. In other words, if you're born into nobility, you are of greater value than a nobody common person. The English believe that during Chaucer's day, Chaucer is going to attack that idea in this story. Now this story is going to begin with a little introduction where she's going to say kind of, you know, uh, something about a partner. You watch, she'll say something kind of nasty about a partner. And then she'll get right into the story and she's going to tell about a knight in olden days who sees a girl walking down the road and he steals her maidenhead. Now what does that mean? Do you know what that means? He steals her maidenhead means what? Right, he rapes her. He forces her to sleep with him, and he rapes her. And in the process of doing, hello, hello, in the process of doing this, he has not only violated the girl, but he's violated the code of a knight. Right? Knights are, not, knights are supposed to treat girls well, not poorly. For this, he's brought in front of the king and queen, and... He's going to be executed. They're going to chop his head off because he's done something really bad. But the queen looks at him and says he's too good looking to cut off his head. Wow. Instead of killing him, we're going to give him a challenge that will take him a year and a day. What will that challenge be is the heart of the story. All right, here we go. We're now listening to the story read out loud. You should be on page 138, 139. All right, Miss Laird, we'll let you take the show. The Canterbury Tales by General Chaucer. When good King Arthur ruled in ancient days, a king that every Briton loves to praise, this was a land brimful of fairy folk. The elf queen and her courtiers joined and broke their elfin dance on many a green mead. Or so was the opinion once, I read, hundreds of years ago, in days of yore. But no one now sees fairies anymore. For now the saintly charity and prayer of holy friars seem to have purged the air. They search the countryside through field and stream as thick as moats that speck the sunbeam. Blessing the halls, the chambers, kitchens, bowers, cities and boroughs, castles, courts and towers, thorps, barns and stables, outhouses and dairies, and that's the reason why there are no fairies. Wherever there was wont to walk an elf, today there walks the holy friar himself, as evening falls, or when the daylight springs, saying his matins and his holy things, walking his limit round from town to town. Women can now go safely up and down. By every bush or under every tree, there is no other incubus but he. So there is really no one else to hurt you, and he will do no more than take your virtue. 
Okay. So, what is it? What was going on during King Arthur's time? It says a hundred years ago during King Arthur's time. You you would see elves and fairies and and it was magical. It was a magical time. But what got rid of the magic? <laughs> they said friars and ministers and the church. So we're in a Christian time now. Okay. Anybody else questions? He talks about uh, women being safe to walk in the streets. There is no other incubus but he, so there is really no one else to hurt you. And he will do no more than take your virtue. What does that mean? Um, there is somebody hiding under the bush. What are they going to do? That's the only thing you have to worry about. Bush hiders? <laughs> okay, let's move on. Now, it so happened, I began to say, long, long ago, in good King Arthur's day, there was a knight who was a lusty liver. One day, as he came riding from the river, he saw a maiden walking all forlorn ahead of him, alone as she was born. And of that maiden, spite of all she said, by a very force, he took her maidenhead. This act of violence made such a stir, so much petitioning of the king for her, that he condemned the knight to lose his head by course of law. He was as good as dead. It seemed that then the statues took that view, but that the queen, and other ladies too, implored the king to exercise his grace. So ceaselessly he gave the queen the case and granted her his life, and she could choose whether to show him mercy or refuse. Okay. Real quick, this is what Mr. McGee was talking about. So there's a woman in front of the knight, and he attacks her. And according to the laws of the land, he should have lost his head. But the queen decided to take his case, and so she's going to decide what's going to happen. Okay, we're at the top of 140. The queen returned him thanks with all her might. And then she sent a summons to the knight at her convenience, and expressed her will. You stand, for such is the position still, in no way certain of your life, said she, yet you shall live if you can answer me. What is the thing that women most desire? Beware the axe, and say as I require. If you can't answer on the moment, though, I will concede you this. You are to go a twelve-month and a day to seek and learn sufficient answer. Then you shall return. I shall take gauges from you to extort surrender of your body to the court. Sad was the knight, and sorrowfully sighed, but there all other choices were denied, and in the end he chose to go away and to return after a year and day, armed with such answer as there might be sent to him by God. He took his leave and went. Okay, what were the, uh, what did the queen say he had to do if he didn't want to die? Find out what women most desire. What do women want? If you can answer me this in 12 months, then you can, I'll let you live. Okay, moving on. He knocked at every house, searched every place, yes, anywhere that offered hope and grace. What could it be that women wanted most? But all the same, he never touched a coast, country, or town in which there seemed to be any two people willing to agree. Some said that women wanted wealth and treasure. Honor, said some. Some, jollity and pleasure. Some, gorgeous clothes, and others, fun in bed. To be oft widowed and remarried, said others again, and some that what most mattered was that we should be cosseted and flattered. That's very near the truth, it seems to me. A man can win us best with flattery. To dance attendance on us, make a fuss, and snares us all, the best and worst of us. So he goes around asking all these different women, what do you really want? What were some of the answers that he got? Flattery. Flattery. Some said they wanted new clothes. Wealth. 
Some said, well, I want to get married multiple times. <laughs> Others said, I want to have fun in bed. Well, <laughs> he got multiple, multiple answers, but what did he say? None, none, none. none of them don't, none of them just doesn't seem right. They're not telling me what they really want. So we're at the top of 141. Some say the things we most desire are these. Freedom to do exactly as we please. There you go. Right, that one With goes. no one to reprove our faults and lies, rather to have one call us good and wise. You guys might want to write Truly, down line 82. There's not one in ten score who has a fault, and someone rubs the sore, but she will kick if what he says is true. You try it out, and you will find so too. However vicious we may be within, we like to be thought wise and void of sin. Others assert we women find it sweet when we are thought dependable, discreet and secret, firm of purpose and controlled, never betraying things that we are told. But that's not worth the handle of a rake. Women conceal a thing for heaven's sake. Remember Midas? Will you hear the tale? Among some other little things, now stale, Ovid relates that under his long hair, the unhappy Midas grew a splendid pair of ass's ears. As subtly as he might, he kept his foul deformity from sight. Save for his wife, there was not one that knew. He loved her best and trusted in her too. He begged her not to tell a living creature that he possessed so horrible a feature. And she, she swore, were all the world to win, she would not do such villainy and sin as saddle her husband with so foul a name. Besides, to speak would be to share the shame. Nevertheless, she thought she would have died keeping the secret bottled up inside. It seemed to swell her heart, and she, no doubt, thought it was on the point of bursting out. Okay, before we move on, another thing that some of the ladies said is they want to be trusted. They want it to be known that they're dependable. So, the Lady of Bath moves into another story. So we have another story within a story about Midas. What what was going on with this guy? <coughs> he had donkey ears. <laughs> and his wife did what? Swore she wouldn't tell. She kept his secret. So she was showing that she could be trusted. That. Uh, she was dependable. One of this is continuing on what some of those other women said. Now, at the end of this, it says she's busting to tell somebody. So let's find out what she does. Fearing to speak of it to woman or man, down to a reedy marsh, she quickly ran and reached the sedge. Her heart was all on fire, and as a bitter bumble in the mire, she whispered to the water near the ground. Betray me not, O water, with thy sound. To thee alone I tell it. It appears my husband has a pair of asses' ears. Ah, my heart's well again. The secret's out. I could no longer keep it, not a doubt. And so, you see, although we may hold fast a little while, it must come out at last. We can't keep secrets. As for Midas, well, read Ovid for the story. So what does the wife do? What does Midas' wife do? She tells her husband. She has to say it out loud. She has to get rid of it. So she goes down to the water, and she whispers it to the water. And then she feels it. Okay, so now we've got the story within the story. Let's move on to the next two. He will tell. This night that I am telling you about perceived at last he never would find out what it could be that women loved the best. Faint was the soul within his sorrowful breast as home he went. He dared no longer stay. His year was up, and now it was the day. As he rode home in a dejected mood, suddenly, at the margin of a wood, he saw a dance upon the leafy floor of four and twenty ladies, nay, and more. Eagerly he approached, in hope to learn some words of wisdom ere he should return. But lo, before he came to where they were, dancers and dance all vanished into air. There wasn't a living creature to be seen save one old woman crouched upon the green. A fouler-looking creature, I suppose, could scarcely be imagined. She arose and said, Sir Knight, there's no way on from here. Tell me what you are looking for. 
for, my dear, for peradventure that were best for you. We old, old women know a thing or two. Okay, so it's years up. He's on his way back. He hasn't figured it out yet. And he comes upon what? An uh, old woman. Before the old woman. Well, a whole bunch of people. A whole bunch of women <laughs> dancing around. And as soon as he got up there, they disappeared. And all that was left was a really haggard, ugly old woman. And so she says, ask me a question. Maybe I'll have the answer because old women are wise. Dear mother, said the knight, alack the day, I am as good as dead, if I can't say what thing it is that women most desire. If you could tell me, I would pay your hire. Give me your hand, she said, and swear to do whatever I shall next require of you, if so to do should lie within your might, and you shall know the answer before night. Upon my honor, he answered, I agree. Then, said the crone, I dare to guarantee your life is safe. I shall make good my claim. Upon my life, the queen will say the same. Show me the very proudest of them all in costly coverchief or jeweled call that dare say no to what I have to teach. Let us go forward without further speech. And then she crooned her gospel in his ear and told him to be glad and not to fear. They came to court. This knight, in full array, stood forth and said, O oh, queen, I've kept my day and kept my word and have my answer ready. There sat the noble matrons and the heady young girls and widows too that have the grace of wisdom all assembled in that place. And there the queen herself was throned to hear and judge his answer. Then the knight drew near and silence was commanded through the hall. The queen then bade the knight to tell them all what thing it was that women wanted most. He stood not silent like a beast or post, but gave his answer with the ringing word of a man's voice, and the assembly heard. Okay, before we hear it, what does the old crone say to him? There's a few, um, do whatever she needs him to do, but still I have the answer by the She doesn't tell him what he's going to have to do, but she says, if you agree to do whatever I tell you to do, you have to agree to it. I, I'll help you out with this. I'll, I'll give you the answer. So they make it to the court, and they're before the queen. And he's about to give his answer. My liege and lady in general, said he, a woman wants the self-same sovereignty over her husband as over her lover, and master him. He must not be above her. That is your greatest wish. Whether you kill or spare me, please yourself. I wait your will. In all the court, not one that shook her head or contradicted what the knight had said. Maid, wife, and widow cried. He saved his life. So what was the answer? To be equal to him. Did, did he seek to be equal? He said sovereignty. Sovereignty, which means what? <coughs> That women have the control. What women want is to have control over their husbands and their loves. <laughs> and master him. He must not be above her. That is, you guys might want to mark line 186. If you're going to be using quotes in your paper. Okay, moving on. And on the word, up started the old wife, the one the knight saw sitting on the green, and cried, Your mercy, sovereign lady queen, before the court disperses, do me right. Twas I who taught this answer to the knight, for which he swore and pledged his honor to it, that the first thing I asked of him he'd do it, so far as it should lie within his might. Before this court, I ask you then, sir knight, to keep your word and take me for your wife. For well you know that I have saved your life. If this be false, deny it on your sword. Alas, he said, Old lady, by the Lord, I know indeed that such was my behest. But for God's love, think of a new request. Take all my goods, but leave my body free. A curse on us, she said, if I agree. I may be foul, I may be poor and old, 
yet will not choose to be for all the gold that's bedded in the earth or lies above less than your wife, nay, than your very love. My love, said he, by heaven, my damnation, alas, that any of my race and station should ever make so foul a misalliance. Yet in the end, his pleading and defiance all went for nothing. He was forced to wed. He takes his ancient wife and goes to bed. So, what was it that she wanted from him? She wanted a man. She wants to hang she wants his body. <laughs> but is that it? Yeah. She just wanted to be her lover? What was her demand? She wants to be in control. She wants to be in control. She said, you have to marry me. What does that word mean? That, that's what she, that's what was her demand was, that he has to marry her. And he's like, no, I don't want to and then he tries to get out of it, and she says, nope, that was the deal. And so they get married. Moving on, we're in the middle of 145. Now, first venture, something well suspect, a lack of care, since I neglect to tell of the rejoicings and display made at feast upon their wedding day. I have but a short answer to the fall. I say, there was no joy or feast at all. Nothing but heaviness of heart and sorrow. He married her in private on the morrow, and all day long stayed hidden like an owl. It was such torture that his wife looked foul. <laughs> so, on the wedding day, there's supposed to be big celebrations, a party. What, what happened with this wedding? <laughs> they did it in private, and after it was over, when they went and hid, Yep. He was, he's not happy with the fact that he has a really old, ugly wife. Okay, guys. 145. Last paragraph. Great was the anguish churning in his head when he and she were piloted to bed. He wallowed back and forth in desperate style. His ancient wife was smiling all the while. At last, she said, bless us. Is this, my dear, how knights and wives get on together here? Oh. Are these the laws of King Arthur's house? Are knights of his also contemptuous? I am your own beloved and your wife, and I am she indeed that saved your life. And certainly I never did you wrong. Then why this first of nights so sad a sight? You're carrying on as if you were half-witted. Say, for God's love, what sin have I committed? I'll put things right if you will tell me how. So they get married, they have to go to bed, and he's just miserable. And so he's just tossing and turning, and he's cranky, and he's rude. And she says to him, she's like, I saved your wife. I'm your wife. You're supposed to be nice to me. Is this how knights act in, in court? Are you supposed to treat me with respect and be kind? Doesn't want to hate you, thank you. <laughs> So moving on, we're on page 146. Why you want to do something you don't want to do near though? That's just terrible. Put right, he cried. That never can be now. Nothing can ever be put right again. You're old and so abominably plain, so poor to start with, so low bred to follow. It's little wonder if I twist and wallow. God, that my heart would burst within my breast. Is that, said she, the cause of your unrest? Yes, certainly, he said. And can you wonder? I could set right what you suppose a blunder. That's if I cared to in a day or two, if I were shown more courtesy by you. Just now, she said, you spoke of gentle birth, such as descends from ancient wealth and worth. If that's the claim you make for gentlemen, such arrogance is hardly worth a hen. Whoever loves to work for virtuous ends public and private, and who most intends to do what deeds of gentleness he can, take him to be the greatest gentleman. Christ wills we take our gentleness from him, not from a wealth of ancestry long dim, though they bequeath their whole establishment by which we claim to be of high descent. Our fathers cannot make us a bequest of all those virtues that became them best, and earn for them the name of gentleman but let us follow them as best we can. So he responds to Reese and says, but you're so old and plain and ugly and I'm miserable. You're not a gentlewoman. You don't come from money. You're 
have no titles, and she responds and says, does it mean to be a gentleman because of who you are, or where you came from, or is it by your deeds, by being a good person and doing the right thing? So that's how she defines it. Thus, the wise poet of the Florentines, Dante by name, has written in these lines, for such is the opinion Dante launches. Seldom arises by these slender branches prowess of men, for it is God, no less, wills us to claim of him our gentleness. For of our parents nothing can we claim save temporal things, and these may hurt and maim. But everyone knows this as well as I, for if gentility were implanted by the natural course of lineage down the line, public or private, could it cease to shine in doing the fair work of gentle deed? No vice or villainy could then bear seed. Take fire and carry it to the darkest house between this kingdom and the Caucasus, and shut the doors on it and leave it there. It will burn on, and it will burn as fair as if 10,000 men were there to see. For fire will keep its nature and degree, I can assure you, sir, until it dies. But gentleness, as you will recognize, is not annexed in nature to possessions. Men fail in living up to their professions. But fire never ceases to be fire. God knows you'll often find, if you inquire, some lording full of villainy and shame. If you would be esteemed for the mere name of having been by birth a gentleman and stemming from some virtuous noble clan and do not live yourself by gentle deed or take your father's noble code and creed, you are no gentleman, though duke or earl. Vice and bad manners are what make a churl. So this goes back to one of those things in the laws of life. What did it say? What was one of the codes it said? That you have to live up to your family's clan. You have to live. You have to earn being a gentleman. It's not just given to you. You have to live up to that title. Okay. Moving on. We are at the bottom of 147. Now, peradventure, some may well suspect a lack of care in me, since I neglect to tell of the rejoicings and display made at the feast upon their wedding day. I have but a short answer to let fall. I say, there was in this kingdom and the Caucasus, and shut the doors on it and leave it there. It will burn on, and it will burn as fair as if ten thousand men were there to see. For fire will keep its nature and degree, I can assure you, sir until it dies. But gentleness, as you will recognize, is not annexed in nature to possessions. Men fail in living up to their professions. But fire never ceases to be fired. God knows you'll often find, if you inquire, some lording full of villainy and shame. If you would be esteemed for the mere name of having been by birth a gentleman, and stemming from some virtuous noble clan, and do not live yourself by gentle deed, or take your father's noble code and creed. You are no gentleman, though duke or earl. Vice and bad manners are what make a churl. Gentility is only the renown for bounty that your father's handed down, quite foreign to your person, not your own. Gentility must come from God alone. That we are gentle comes to us by grace, and by no means is it pleased with place. <coughs> Reflect how noble, says Valerius, was Tullius, surnamed Hostilius, who rose from poverty to nobleness. And read Boethius, Seneca no less. Thus they express themselves and are agreed. Gentle is he that does a gentle deed. And therefore, my dear husband, I conclude that even if my ancestors were rude, yet God on high, and so I hope he... You guys might want to write down line 316 as a quote to remember. He will, can grant me grace to live in virtue still. A gentlewoman only when beginning to live in virtue, 
and to shrink from sinning. As for my poverty, which you reprove, Almighty God himself, in whom we move, believe, and have our being, chose a life of poverty, and every man or wife, nay, every child can see our heavenly king would never stoop to choose a shameful thing. No shame in poverty, if the heart is gay, as Seneca and all the learned say. He who accepts his poverty unhurt, I'd say, is rich, although he lacked a shirt. But truly poor are they who whine and fret and covet what they cannot hope to get. And he that, having nothing, covets not, is rich, though you may think he is a sot. Okay, so according to the old lady, what should you not do if you are poor? Cry about it. Cry about it. <laughs> Those who accept their state and are happy and are good people are truly rich, according to the old woman. But those who sit there and complain and are unhappy are the really poor ones. So we are moving on to last paragraph on 148. True poverty can find a song to sing. Juvenal says, a pleasant little thing. The poor can dance and sing in the relief of having nothing that will tempt a thief. Though it be hateful, poverty is good, a great incentive to a livelihood, and a great help to our capacity for wisdom, if accepted patiently. Poverty is, though wanting in a state, a kind of wealth that none calumniate. Poverty often, when the heart is lowly, brings one to God and teaches what is holy gives knowledge of oneself, and even lends a glass by which to see one's truest friends. And since it's no offense, let me be plain. Do not rebuke my poverty again. Lastly, you taxed me, sir, with being old. Yet even if you never had been told by ancient books, you gentlemen engage yourselves in honor to respect old age. To call an old man father shows good breeding, and this could be supported from my reading. You say I'm old, and foul and offend. You need not fear to be a cuckold then. Filth and old age, I'm sure you will agree, are powerful wardens upon chastity. Nevertheless, well knowing your delights, I shall fulfill your worldly appetites. Real quick, she says, what's good about having an old ugly wife? You don't have to worry about her running around on you. I'll be faithful to you. I'm not going to cheat on you. So that's, that's a benefit of having an old wife. You have two choices. Which one will you try? To have me old and ugly till I die, but still a loyal, true, and humble wife that never will displease you all her life. Or would you rather I were young and pretty and chance your arm what happens in a city where friends will visit you because of me? Yes, and in other places too, maybe. Which would you have? The choice is all your own. So she gives him a choice. She says, would you rather have a young, pretty wife who likes to run around, or would you like to have an old wife who's loyal to you and you know will do her best to make you happy? The knight thought long, and with a piteous groan, at last he said, with all the care in life, my lady and my love, my dearest wife, I leave the matter to your wise decision. You make the choice yourself. For the provision of what may be agreeable and rich in honor to us both, I don't care which. Whatever pleases you suffices me. And have I won the mastery, said she, since I'm to choose and rule as I think fit? Certainly, wife, he answered her. That's it. Kiss me, she cried. No quarrels. On my oath and word of honor, you shall find me both, that is, both fair and faithful as a wife. May I go howling mad and take my life unless I prove to be as good and true as ever wife was since the world was new. And if tomorrow, when the sun's above, I seem less fair than any lady love, than any queen or empress, east or west, do with my life and death as you think best. Cast up the curtain, husband. Look at me. And when indeed the knight had looked to see, lo, she was young and lovely, rich in charms. In ecstasy he caught her in her arms. His heart went bathing in a bath of blisses and melted in a hundred thousand kisses. 
and she responded in the fullest measure with all that could delight or give him pleasure. So, what was his response when she gave him that choice? That he wanted her. I'll let you pick. I'll let you you decide what what whatever you think is best. I'll go with it. And she says, "Okay, so so you're gonna let me be the boss then?" And he says, "Sure, sure, sure." And in the end, she, she magically turns into a beautiful woman, and she says, "Okay, well, I'm both. I'm young and beautiful, but I'll also be faithful." So they lived ever after to the end in perfect bliss. Oh, and the name of Jesus said as husbands, meek and young and fresh and bad, and grace to overcome them when we live. And days and years like we are not short the lives of those who won't be governed by their lives. And all those angry neighbors of the God send them soon on a very pestilent place. So you got an option. You either gonna have a Victoria's Secret model, drop dead gorgeous, but you gotta worry about her all the time that guys might be messing with her. Guys are coming over to visit you, but maybe they're coming over to see your wife. Or you got this butt ugly woman, but she is this amazing companion for you. Great friend, takes good care of you. And in the end, the options of course are, well, I can't choose, I'll let you choose. And in the moment that he lets her choose, who's won? She has. And how does that relate to the wife's prologue? Women's, women want to be in control. They want to run. They want to run the man, right? That is to say, let them have the power, right? Thank you, the wife of Bath's Tale.